today I'll be talking about scaling PHP in the real world. So my name is Dustin Whittle. Uh, I, you can find out more, uh, more about me at DustinWhittle.com or on Twitter at Dustin Whittle. I've actually already posted the slides on speaker deck, so if you want to download them ahead of time to follow along, there's a lot of notes to get a bit more in depth in my examples. So I've been working on PHP for a little while. Uh, my current role is a developer evangelist at AppDynamics. Uh, previous to that, I worked as a consultant and trainer at Sensi Labs, the creators of Symphony. And previous to that, I brought Yahoo, uh, brought Symphony to Yahoo and rebuilt Delicious and Yahoo Answers and some other projects. So I've been working with PHP for quite a while, and uh, this talk is really focused on common tips that you can apply to any PHP project to get better performance and increase scalability. Uh, I am notoriously fast speaker, so if at any point you want me to slow down, just let me know. So how many of you know that Facebook, Yahoo, Zynga, Tumblr, Etsy, Wikipedia were all built on PHP? Uh, they all were started on PHP, and some are still there, some aren't. But why does performance matter? Why does scalability matter? Uh, when Mozilla shaved 2.2 seconds off their landing page, Firefox downloads increased 15.4%. So they got 60 million more downloads just because the page was slightly faster. And when Barack Obama's website was 60% faster, increased in, in, uh, donations increased by 14%. So he raised 30 million more dollars just because the people were able to donate 100 milliseconds faster. But the most impressive metric I found is when Amazon and Walmart uh, decreased their front end latency by 100 milliseconds, they increased revenue by 1%. So the reality is performance directly impacts the bottom line. So how fast is fast enough? Uh, 100 milliseconds feels instantaneous. Let's get rid of that. Excuse me. So 100 milliseconds feels instantaneous. It feels like you're flipping a pay, uh, page in a book. Uh, one second allows you to think seamlessly, and after three seconds, uh, many studies have been proven that users will abandon your site and lose faith in the checkout process. Uh, there are a lot of better and more efficient tools than PHP, Java, C++, Erlang, Scala, Go are all faster uh, and computationally intensive uh, things than PHP is. And if you've ever seen phpsadness.com, uh, PHP does have its own quirks. It has some design issues and inconsistencies, but the reality is there are ways to scale PHP for high traffic applications, and now we'll dive into a few of those. The reality is PHP is not your problem. Uh, I hear a lot of people argue over single quotes versus double quotes. None of that stuff matters. At the end of the day, uh, it's really about your architecture and not about the specifics of your application. So by a show of hands, how many people run on version 5 PHP 5.3 and above? Anybody older than 5.3? All right, that's the first. So if you're not on at least PHP 5.4, it's time to upgrade your PHP environment to 2013. So I'm a big fan of Nginx. Uh, Nginx and PHP FPM is the, the best way to run PHP nowadays, uh, in my opinion. Um, so it, it's a much better process. It allows you to uh, configure both the PHP FPM pool size as well as the, how Nginx manages connections much more granularly than uh, Apache and Mod PHP, which is very common. So first tip is use an opcode cache. This should be extremely obvious uh, in PHP, but if you're not, uh, PHP interprets the file every time. Uh, and using an opcode cache allows you to interpret it one time and cache the results of that. So I traditionally have been a big fan of APC, which you can install with Peckle install APC. Uh, as of PHP 5.5, there is Zend opcache, which is included by default. So again, if you're running anything older than PHP 5.5, I highly recommend APC. So this is a bit more controversial, but use autoloading and follow the PSR0 standard. So uh, autoloading in a lot of cases, uh, so what autoloading is is uh, straightforward. When you look for a class, usually you have to require this. Autoloading allows you to register a function that auto automatically knows how to look up where the file is located and require it on your behalf without actually uh, using require statements. So if you're using modern frameworks, most of them do this by default, but if you're not, this is very easy to do. Instead of managing require and include one statements, you can simply register an autoload handler and follow PSR0 convention and uh, benefit from that. So I'm a big fan of the Symphony, uh, Symphony, Symphony 2 libraries. Uh, most of them are available as individual components. One of those is the Symphony autoloader component, uh, or class loader component rather, which allows you to cache the class map in the APC. 
the, the benefit is that you can drop this into any existing project. So PHP is uh, very easy to develop in. Uh, it's also uh, very easy to add to many servers. When you're on a single server, the only thing you have to change to add uh, additional servers is to scale out your sessions. So you need a distributed session store. So the first piece of advice is really optimize your sessions. There's a couple of different approaches to this that I found to be successful. So the problem is that uh, the default session store in PHP is to persist, uh, persist sessions to disk. And as soon as you add another server to this, uh, the sessions get duplicated. So you need to really have a distributed session store. But it's much better to store sessions in a database. Even better than that is to store sessions in a database in front with a cache, like Memcache or Redis. But the best approach that I found, and what's used by most of the large web companies, is to store your sessions in a signed or encrypted cookie. <laughs> So the limitation with this is that cookies have a max size. So if you store a lot of data uh, in, uh, in your session, you can exceed the cookie size across browsers and the session will be corrupted. Uh, the biggest benefit is that you don't need to go to the database or cache to pull the session every time. You can simply validate the signature on your cookie and as long as the, uh, the signature matches, you know the cookie hasn't been changed. So you can rely on the data. This is very easy to do in PHP. You can simply change the session handler, and Symfony 2's HTTP foundation component allows you to easily abstract that as well. So the next bit of advice is really leverage an in-memory data cache, and you can use this in a variety of ways. So how many of you use memcache by show of hands? And how about Redis? All right, so if you're already using these, you're off to a good start, but there's a lot of operations that you can cache. Uh, the general piece of advice that I give is any data that is expensive to generate and query uh, and long live should be cached. So this includes web service responses, uh, full page caching, HTTP responses, any database result sets, and, uh, and oftentimes configuration data. So Guzzle is an HTTP client for PHP. I think it's the most fully featured client available today. Uh, and it has built-in support for caching web service requests. So it's very easy to use Guzzle, uh, back it up with memcache, and then whenever you make HTTP requests, as long as they haven't changed, they'll follow the HTTP caching standard, and it'll be pulled from the cache instead of making another request. And then the Docker and ORM. So the Docker and ORM, uh, it's debatable whether you should add an ORM to a project. I think it greatly depends on the complexity of your data model. Um, in my experience, the benefits of NORM greatly outweigh the performance costs. Anytime you add abstraction, there's a, uh, the cost comes out of performance. With that said, if you properly apply doctrine, it's very easy to get great performance, and you can leverage in-memory caching with memcache or Redis natively. So the way it looks is very straightforward. You have a request, talks to the web server, uh, it goes to the cache. If nothing's in the cache, we'll go to the database. If it's in the database, when it comes back out, we'll be put into the cache. And then the next request, will use the cache instead of relying on the database. Pretty straightforward. Now, this is a bigger one. Uh, and this isn't only related to performance, but also to scalability. So do blocking work in the background via task and queues. So there's a bunch of different solutions for this. I'm only gonna talk about one today because it's very simple to explain, but there's Rescue, Gearman, RabbitMQ, Kafka, Beanstalk, Zero, Q, and ActiveMQ. Some of these are messaging layers, some of these are task systems and queuing systems, but I'm gonna focus on Rescue. Rescue is a task manager for PHP. It's a very straightforward queuing system. So again, just uh, general advice is any process that is slow and not important for the immediate response should be queued. So common examples of this are sending email, querying web services, or sending notifications like Facebook posts or Twitter posts, um, any analytics or instrumentation, updating profiles, discovering friends, any operation that takes a long time. And in some cases, this is enforced. So if, for example, if you're using Twitter's streaming API, if you can't handle the, the Firehose fast enough, uh, they'll disconnect you. So in some cases, this is crucial. But what this looks like is a user submits a form, uh, you update the database, so some insert statement or some update statement, you refresh the cache, you send some email, you send a notification, and then you recommend some new friends based on some, some information. Um, cumulatively, all of these in operations individually are quite fast, but cumulatively the user ends up waiting 3.7 seconds. 
The reality is a lot of this stuff can be done in the background, uh, so you can immediately return the response and then do all the stuff uh, while the user is not waiting. So when you're using tasks and queues, or background jobs, if you will, this is actually much more straightforward. So you update the database, and then you create a, a task to send orders, which is refresh the cache, send emails, send notifications, recommend new friends. And now the user's only waited 300 milliseconds. And in the back end, they have background jobs that allow you to refresh the cache and send mails and do other background-related work. So instead of waiting uh, 2.7 seconds, you can wait uh, 300 milliseconds. So this comes at, uh, there's several advantages to this. One, each, each queue can be scaled individually, and you can just add more workers to process more jobs faster in the background, uh, but also decrease latency for the user because they're not waiting for all this stuff to happen at once. So here's what it looks like. <coughs> You have a queue, uh, you can, highly depends on your application design, but in this simple example, we have uh, two queues. Uh, sorry, one queue with uh, several workers. Here we have process number one that will refresh the cache, send mails, send notifications, and another one that does some other task. So now the queue, queue starts off empty, you get a, re a request that comes in, they issue some tasks in the background, you create these jobs, the jobs get processed out of each queue. When you want to process jobs faster, you can simply add more workers to pull more jobs. And this allows you to scale much faster, scale easier. In plain PHP, it might look like this. So without a background job, you have a regular class, so a plain old PHP object that is a controller in action. In this case, we have an action that calls several methods. One of those methods is send email, another one send notifications, etc. Now, when you have a background job in your controller, in your action, you can simply enqueue background jobs. So here we have rescue, enqueue, queue, do that, do this, et cetera. So send emails, send notifications. And each one of those can be abstracted to a class or a function that actually is self-contained and can do each one of these operations, like send email, send notification. So it's very easy to drop into an existing project and uh, get better performance out of that, as well as increase scalability. So I think this is the biggest one. Uh, leverage HTTP caching. So how many of you uh, use HTTP caching today? Okay, so about half. Um, how many of you read the HTTP caching spec? Right, some of you are lying. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you can use the Symphony 2 HTTP Foundation component, which abstracts around the HTTP protocol. Uh, but one of the best things about the HTTP protocol is they've thought through all these caching issues 10, 10 years ago. Well, I guess 15, 20 at this point. Uh, and it allows you to leverage HTTP caching. A lot of you are probably familiar with this when it comes to uh, caching browser assets like JavaScript and CSS. It's a very common to put a far futures expires header and then the browser will never f download an asset again. This is the same concept but applied to the server side. So here we have a load balancer with Varnish which is a reverse proxy cache talking to an app server doing some background work. So Alice comes in, she requests the slash welcome page. Uh, we check the cache, there's nothing in the cache, so we go to the app server and request slash welcome. In this case, it's just gonna return hello world, and it's gonna return a 200 response and send that all the way back to the user. Now, you really have to choose between two strategies when you deal with HTTP caching. They can be combined, but the ones that I'm gonna cover are expires and invalidation. Expires is very straightforward. Uh, this content is good until this date. So don't request this content until this date has passed. So expiration, pretty straightforward. Here, Alice requests slash welcome. Uh, it doesn't exist in the cache, so it goes back to the application server, which is PHP, simply print hello world. We send back a 200 response with the cache control header max age 600 seconds. So what we're saying here is that this content is valid for 600 seconds from this point in time. And that gets stored in the cache and sent back to the user. So the only addition here is the cache control header, max age 600. Now the next request, a separate user, Bob, comes in, requests the welcome page, checks the cache. Because the cache is still valid, it just simply skips the back end call and goes directly from the cache back to Bob. Uh, because 30 seconds have passed, we say the age is 30 seconds, the cache control header is max age 600. 
pretty straightforward. Uh, the next one is validation. So validation uh, is a bit more complex, but still relatively easy. So Alice comes in, she fetches slash welcome. Again, we make the request to the app server because it doesn't exist in the cache. And this time we issue an e-tag with the last modified header. So the last modified is the date the content change, and e-tag is simply a unique identifier for a representation of this resource at this time. So this could be an MD5 of a blog post ID and the number of comments. There's any, uh, there's a number of different methods to building this, but the reality is all it needs to be is unique for this particular request. And then we send that back to the user. So last modified with an e-tag. Now, the next request comes in from Bob, goes to git slash welcome. Uh, we say, if the content is modified since this date, or if none match the e tag that we had previously, if that exists in the cache and it's still valid, we'll return it. Uh, but more importantly, we need to check with the back end to validate that the content is still valid. So you're still making an additional request to your app server. The benefit is that the request to the app server is much lighter weight. So all you really need to be able to do is validate that the content is still valid. So that is uh, much lighter than generating a full HTTP response. So here we're just going to generate a validator, not generate the response, and simply because the cache is still valid, the content date hasn't changed, we're gonna send a 304 not modified header, and it'll be served directly from the cache. Again, the benefit to this strategy with expires the backend request doesn't happen at all. So there is no validation that the content is still fresh. We're simply relying on a date and a point in time that has not passed. With validation, we're gonna make a request to the backend, but in theory, the response is very quick to generate because all you need to do is validate that the content is still uh, fresh. And if so, again, we'll pass it back to the user. So the difference is uh, you can combine expiration and invalidation very easily. So here we can do git slash welcome from Alice, um, go back to the back end, generate the validators, check if the content is still fresh or not, and then use cache control max age. So this is uh, fresh for another 60 seconds. Don't check back unless that time is passed. So the next request comes in because it's less than 60 seconds old. Uh, 30 seconds later, we have another request from Bob, the slash welcome, goes to the cache. Because the cache uses the expires option with the cache control header max age, uh, and the age has not passed, there is no request to the back end. Now, let's say uh, a minute later, another request comes in. We go to slash welcome. We have the if mod uh, modified since. We check with the back end, generate some validators, either to create a new response because the cache is no longer valid, or simply confirm that the cache is still valid and we send a 304 not modified header with a, another cache control header of max age 60 seconds. So don't check again for 60 seconds. The goal here is to really alleviate load on your application servers by caching the HTTP responses. So there's a bunch of different servers available to do this, Apache, Nginx, uh, Squid, but my favorite is Varnish. Uh, so use Varnish as a reverse proxy cache to alleviate load on your application servers. So I've done a lot of consulting and training in my past, and I can't tell you how many projects I've walked into where everyone uses the default settings and nothing's been done to optimize the framework. Whether it's Drupal, WordPress, Symfony, Zen Framework, whatever, they all have options uh, to enable caching and to enable uh, basically HTTP caching, results set caching, web service response caching, etc. So some basic tips that apply really to any project are stay up to date with the latest stable version of your favorite framework. Uh, disable features you're not using. This seems surprisingly obvious, but a lot of times people turn on everything in their project and don't give it a second thought. So if you don't need security, disable it. For every feature, there, it comes at the cost of performance. So remember that. If you don't need internationalization, disable it. And always use a data cache. Memcache and Redis are extremely easy to set up and manage. So enable caching features for views and database result sets, and always use an HTTP cache like Varnish. Uh, so this is a bit more advanced, and I'm gonna give you a very simple version of this. Um, when it comes to uh, application servers, oftentimes you can add as many application servers as you want, but at some point you're gonna max out throughput on your database server. Uh, maxing out read throughput is a relatively easy problem to solve. You can just add slaves uh, or replicas to that. Um, but once you max out your write throughput, uh, which is the biggest issue, what do you do? 
You can buy bigger hardware, so you can buy your way out of that problem to a point, but once you spend as much money as you can on hardware, you have to change how you manage your data differently. Uh, so this is sharding. I'm gonna give a very crude example, but it simply comes down to taking a large problem and making it into manageable smaller chunks. So here we have uh, users, images, and comments all in one database. Uh, we've maxed out a write throughput, so what do we do? In this case, uh, we want to break this down into shards. So one approach, and again, a very crude approach, is to just break down uh, users, images, and comments and separate by the user ID. So where the users' names A through H live in one database, users I through S live in another database, and users T through Z live in yet another database. Um, this is very simple, and it uh, will we'll solve your write throughput problems. Um, but becomes very difficult to manage. So Doctrine provides some utilities for handling sharding. Um, it's something that you likely won't have to, to handle at any point in your future. More often than not, uh, what I've seen are service-oriented architectures with Java, Scala, Erlang, Go, or Node on the back end, and PHP being the glue on the front end. And nowadays, more people are doing all the heavy work in something like Angular or Ember and simply using a JSON REST API to provide the data. Um, this is a very common approach. It's some that we've used at uh, Yahoo. Uh, there's other companies that have taken a completely alternative approach, but companies of great scale tend to move away from PHP or create their own variant. Um, PHP is very good at solving some problems. It's very inefficient at solving others. So some examples of this are Yahoo and YPHP. So Yahoo has their own suite of utilities, which they just prefix with Y, and the uh, real benefit here is you have to move code to extensions. So a lot of Yahoo, the way they solve uh, their PHP problems, at least, is code that was previously in PHP uh, to be a PHP extension written in C++ um, or C, right? So the goal here is anything that's computationally intensive, you can move to an extension and get the performance improvement of that. Uh, very easy to apply. Other companies like Facebook have taken a completely different approach, which is um, rewrite PHP completely. So hip hop uh, is a PHP project, sorry, is a pro open source project by Facebook. Uh, the hip hop version one essentially took PHP and converted it to C++ and compiled it into a runtime. Um, hip hop 2.0 is a just in time compiler for PHP and, it's, and a VM. So this is really the extreme. Um, the difference for companies like this is if they improve performance by 2%, they're saving 20 to $50 million on hardware, right? Uh, most of you guys don't have this problem or this budget, so a lot of the practical tips that I provided are much more, uh, much better idea. Uh, the, Facebook has put a lot of effort into, PH, uh, into PHP, both improving the core language, but also into improving hip hop. So today, hip hop uh, is not really usable by a lot of people because it doesn't support the extensions you use or because there are just bugs and incompatibility. But over the last few months, they put a lot of effort into supporting common frameworks. So what you're looking at is the graph of uh, passing tests for each framework. So in some cases, if you use any of these tools, uh, you likely can't use hip hop. Um, but if you're writing straight PHP code and don't use a lot of extensions, you can likely drop hip hop into your project and get a 300% performance improvement. Uh, but this was uh, you know, three months ago. This was maybe 40%. In the last three months, they've come a long way. And three months from now, they'll have support for symphonies and framework two, et cetera, hopefully. Um, okay, so the rest, the, the, all of the rest of this talk is really um, how to profile code for PHP performance. Um, if you follow these general tips, you use HTTP caching, uh, cache your database, web service calls, uh, stay up to date with your PHP stack, do background, uh, do tasks in the background with workers and queues, uh, that will get you pretty far. Most of you won't need to go beyond that, but oftentimes you'll need to actually profile your code. So uh, Derek Reedens, who's right up front here, has worked on an extension called Xdebug. Thank you for that, by the way, on behalf of everyone in the room. Uh, Xdebug is a, lot, a tool that allows you to uh, profile your PHP code. Uh, it does a lot more than that, but today I'll focus on this piece. Uh, and then there's also another tool called WebGrind, which is a web-based front end for cache grind profiles. So what Xdebug does is allow you to get insights into how fast your code is. So how many function vacations, and then what's the total cost of that call in, in terms of uh, raw performance, like milliseconds. So this graphic is not nearly high enough resolution, uh, but what I was attempting to show here is a PHP call graph 
where you can see the count of each method call and then the cumulative total cost of that count in milliseconds. So essentially learning how to uh, take a look at, this is a Symphony 2 app going to the front controller uh, for a particular request. Uh, being able to take a look where you're actually spending time in PHP. Is it the framework that's initializing? Is it looking up uh, particular calls? But really being able to understand at a method level um, how to profile. Uh, Xdebug and WebGrind are very good uh, for this use case. So XHProf and XHProf GUI allow you to do something similar, but uh, really built for running in production. The problem with XDebug is that it adds 200% uh, overhead to your dev environments. In my experience, it's uh, quite slow. So it's not something you want to run in production, but it's a great tool. So uh, XHProf and XHProf GUI really allow you to uh, get the same sort of insights, but in production, it's, it's really a profiler. <laughs> Uh, and then the company I work for is called AppDynamics. Essentially what we do is uh, application performance monitoring for production. Uh, so we'll figure out each one of your, somewhere here. Uh, yeah, so we figure out each one of your controllers, figure out what healthy performance looks like. Uh, but more importantly, when things break, we tell you what's wrong and where you're spending that time. Uh, what external calls you're making to web services, databases, et cetera. Uh, it's free to try and check it out. Um, so just to recap some of these tips, upgrade to PHP 5.5, stay up to date with your latest framework, optimize your session store, um, cache all your database web service calls in memcache and Redis, do blocking work in the background with tasks and queues, use HTTP caching, and when you need to, profile your code with Xdebug and WebGrind, uh, and monitor production performance. So by a show of hands, how many of you know what your production performance looks like today? Right. How many of you work for reputable, or what you would call reputable web companies? No, reputable? Respectable is probably a better word choice. <laughs> right, and three of you know how fast production is or when you're having problems, so investigate that. Um, but really you need to understand where to spend your time optimizing. So the rest of this I'm gonna talk about optimizing the client side because a lot of PHP users, they focus only on the server side, but the reality is you spend more time in the client side than you do on the server side. The 200 milliseconds you're spending waiting on PHP to uh, send an HTTP response is nothing compared to the one or two seconds you're waiting for the browser to actually render the DOM, download any related assets. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on optimizing the client side. So again, most of the latency in modern applications, especially with Angular and Ember, uh, you're shifting work that was previously done on the server side by rendering straight HTML to the client side uh, where the resources aren't shared. So you need to focus on that. Uh, a very easy tip is to optimize your client side assets. So you can use a library called Ascetic to combine CSS and JavaScript and minify it, and et cetera, as well as to optimize images uh, and a lot of things that you can do at build time to optimize your end user experience. Um, there's a great tool set by Google called Google PageSpeed that allows you to get PageSpeed Insights. So PageSpeed Insights, uh, one, you can go to uh, their uh, PageSpeed Insights landing page and just plug in a URL and get performance tips for how to improve the end user experience. Some are very basic, like use HTTP expires headers um, minify your JavaScript, minify CSS, etc. cetera. Uh, and then others are a little bit more uh, tricky, like eliminate rendering, blocking JavaScript and CSS above the fold content. Uh, the reason I like this tool so much is one, it's available as a website. Uh, two, if you use Google Chrome, it's available as part of the Chrome developer tools. Um, but my favorite bit is uh, they offer an API. So it's very easy to integrate into your continuous integration, continuous deployment uh, flow with Jenkins. So you can simply curl a URL with a public, publicly accessible URL and get back a JSON response with tips to improve performance. So really the heart of this is scalability is about the entire architecture, not some minor code optimization. Single quotes versus double quotes, uh, adding periods versus commas, like none of that stuff matters. One, it's all fixed at compile time anyways. Um, so, yeah, think about the best practices are really in the architecture. It's not about the specifics of your application. None of that matter, right? Uh, it's really about how everything's glued together, right? Using, a, using background tasks and queues will get you much more than switching to single quotes. 
any any questions? I think I've gone short, a little too fast. Too fast? Yeah, too fast. Any questions? What um, what you said is um, can be applied with HTTP 1.1, but the second version of the spec is uh, being right written. Sorry, uh, uh, and how do you find, what 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 um, what advice uh, would be um, still? Uh, so, yeah. So uh, with HTTP, <laughs> sorry, it's quite all right. Um, your your English is much better than my French, so no worries. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, HTTP caching is available in HTTP one point one. What do you do with uh, HTTP two point zero? Um, sadly, I don't know the HTTP 2.0 spec that's very much in flux right now. Uh, as I understand it, they're going to do it over HTTPS only. Uh, so I don't know how to answer that question, sadly. Um, all the other advice still applies. Um, I thought the HTTP 2.0 would include the caching spec, but I'm not, not sure. I need to I read the latest spec, to be honest. The big thing uh, with uh, HTTP 2.0 will be multiplexing. Mm -hmm. So maybe a lot of... Uh, a lot of me, uh, Minimizing and, uh, and such, uh, it's, it's not so... But that's avoiding the network overhead, right? Uh, multiplexing requests avoids the network overhead, but it doesn't solve caching, right? The content's still valid, I just don't have to ask for it. Or the way I ask for it is more efficient, because I can ask for multiple resources at one time. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure, to be honest. I need to read the spec. Any other questions? Hello. How could you um, how could you uh, improve the performance of the front uh, if you have caching different uh, level caching like uh, the database front end CDN and uh, stuff like this if you want to improve the back end uh, code uh, so improving the back end code comes down to profiling so that's where tools like Xdebug and WebGrind come in uh, being able to see what's inefficient and what's not um, it greatly depends on the specifics of your application. Things that you can do to improve the performance of the backend time are inserting tasks in the background um, or using uh, memcache for web service requests or database requests. Uh, so much of it depends on the specifics of your application. I try to give generic advice that applies to uh, really not just PHP applications, but any application in general. Um, so to answer your question, how do you improve performance of backend code? Profile it, find where your performance problems are, and uh, either rewrite the code to be more efficient or uh, change how the, the, the design of the underlying architecture. I mean, it depends on the specific problem. <coughs> Any other questions? Hi. Um, does SSL encryption have a massive effect on performance? Not with modern hardware, and the right uh, SSL uh, with the right cipher. Um, yeah, there's a common misbelief that uh, using HTTPS uh, means you won't get nearly as many requests per second. Uh, the SSL handshake is quite expensive, um, but any subsequent requests, once you've agreed on an algorithm, exchange keys should be quite fast. But a lot of that depends on the cipher. So uh, RC4 is quite fast. Um, it depends on what, uh, how much security you want. Sorry. Um, how many bits are in the key and the cipher. So uh, you can you can tweak. Uh, there's a couple of great blog posts I'm happy to follow up about uh, the preferred ciphers. Nginx and Apache will allow you to specify which ciphers you prefer, but during the original SSL connection, the browser needs to negotiate that with the server and agree on a cipher and exchange keys. Any other questions? Hi. <clears throat> Uh, how would you tackle the issue when you would have to, you would need to uh, cache responses and uh, you would need also to deliver them with SSL enabled because Varnish doesn't work with the uh, HTTPS, so how do you do that? So you can front that with Nginx, yeah, absolutely. So the question is, um, 
Varnish doesn't support SSL, so how do you handle uh, SSL with Varnish? So it's very easy to put an Nginx uh, instance in front of Varnish and pass through all the requests. Or HA proxy. Yeah, so uh, HA proxy, uh, Amazon's ELBs, all of those are good solutions. Um, yeah, HA proxy is specifically built for this, right? High availability proxy. Um, yeah, I prefer Nginx. Uh, but Nginx also has a proxy cache module that will allow you to do a lot of what uh, Varnish does. Um, one of the really good combinations that I've found is to actually use Nginx for the entire stack uh, and use Nginx uh, proxy cache module with memcache as a backend. So you still have the benefit of having a distributed cache, a distributed HTTP cache behind Nginx uh, powered by memcache. Anything else? All right, well, thanks for having me and uh, enjoy the rest of PHP 4.